actually, and I think that defines kind of who, who I am and why I do what I do. I remember, I think I may have been eight or nine years old. I was with my grandmother. She was always sewing a blanket or always something that she was doing. And I had this just, I said, I need to ask my grandma this. She was very religious, um, very religious. And I said, I, I'm, I'm dealing with something. I need, to, I need to be courageous to ask her. Um, and I said, grandma, I think I may have been about nine or 10 years old. And I said, grandma, if, if I'm about 80% or 85% good all the time, some of you are laughing because you know where this is going. Will I get to heaven? Because I've been carrying that <laughs> since you told me that we needed to be good and we needed to do the right things and these things kind of things. And I, and you know, my grandma turned around with this serious face. I thought she was going to have a little grace, a little compassion. Uh, she turned and looked me straight in the eye. She goes, no. She said, you will not get to heaven. She said, you need to be 100%. You need to be 100%. And I said, that's in, in my head. I never questioned it. I just said, that's impossible. <laughs> I like to break windows. You know, I like to, you know, I said, that's not going to happen. But, you know, I, you know, but here's the thing. And a lot of folks that I've shared this story with, they think, boy, that was harsh. I needed that. I needed to strive for excellence. And excellence is 100%, right? And really, when I dig down and what the journey that we've been on at SAC has been centered around excellence, if we're going to fulfill our mission, we need to go all in for our mission. We can't have one foot in, one foot out. If we're going to educate the new leaders of San Antonio with this, with the mindset of, of including everyone, understanding our history, understanding who we are as a people, then we got to go all in. We got to go all in. We can't just kind of say, well, I'm just going to give it enough just to get by. Let me hope I get a B in Dr. Ramos's uh, class and get by and get through. And no, 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 no. 100% all the time. 100% of effort all the time. That's what, that's, that's what I truly believe in. So they asked me, well, what ties your day in? The day ends when the day ends. I don't know what the day ends. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a set when that ends. Um, and I think each of you have the ability and the know-how uh, and the ganas to do it, you know, and, and follow that very simple consejo that maybe I didn't understand at nine or 10, but I truly understand it now. And I have lived by it. And as a result, we have achieved tremendous success here at San Antonio College because of that mindset. And it's not just me. It's, it's the faculty, it's the staff, it's the students that have this unwavering um, sense of mission to do the right thing, to do something bigger than themselves. And, I, and we want to support that. So I, it's, sometimes it's a little hard to be a little vulnerable at times, but you know what? Vulnerability is about being courageous. It's about connecting with your fellow people, with your gente, to say, don't be embarrassed about these things. These are the things that shape you. These are the things that mold you, that, 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 that your, those convictions want to come out of you, and you want to be able to demonstrate that in, in productive ways. Don't be embarrassed about that. Don't, don't underestimate the power of home, of your gente, of your people, of your kitchen table of those times that you spent talking with the loved ones, the matriarch, the patriarchs that told you all these things that you guys have a responsibility, not just to yourselves and your future generations, but the people that have come before you because they had to sacrifice, tremendous sacrifices for you guys to have a way to be better. See, my grandmother wanted what she instilled in me that I had something special in me. I had to go find what that was. I didn't understand what she saw in me, but she, she embedded that in me. And I began to believe it, guys. I began to believe that there was something different about me. Each of you have that. 
each of you have a gift, a talent in you that you need to share, that you need to find, you need to each, and start using that as a way to propel you as an individual, your family, your community, whatever that is, whatever that purpose is for you, find that, find what that is. So to me, that's what today represents. That's what this month represents. More than just amazing, um, an amazing lineup of, 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 uh, of discussions and programming and activity. Those are going to be great. You know why? Because they're going to they're gonna make your mind kind of expand. You're going to be challenged on, on some of your own thoughts and, 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 and those kinds of things. That's great. Because the more you learn, the more responsibility you're going to have as an individual to give back to figure it out for you, to figure it out for your family, to figure it out for this community. And I'm going to challenge you that it only takes one person to change this community. One person. You're like, I don't think so. Yes. Here's the thing. If you hit the home run, if you hit the home run, you begin to change your family. You begin to change that makeup of expectations of excellence for your family. When you start changing your family, you start changing generations to come. When those generations start to change, you start to change your community. I'm telling you, that's the power of you. That's the power of one. It doesn't, it, it's, we overcomplicate it sometimes. It's hard, no doubt. It's hard. If it was easy, everybody would have it. But I want to challenge each and every one of you. You're here for a reason. And I don't know what that reason is. Other than we have a great line of things to, to present to you. A great lineup. But there's a reason why you chose to come today. And you've got to think about it. Well, what is it in me that I'm here? There's something special. There's something in me that says you need to be here. You need to hear this. You need to start getting focused about what's next for you. So I began to think of those opportunities in that way. And I said, there's a purpose. It's not, it's not happenstance. It's not by chance. It's a purpose. And start connecting those things so that you can, so, so, so that you can achieve and realize your best self. And your best self is rooted in your gente, your people, your home. That's what it's rooted in. Those are the consejos. Those are the great pieces of advice that you will propel so that that history never gets lost. If it wasn't for these home, these amazing little hole in the walls in our backyard here at Senate, I probably would never eat another homemade tortilla again because that was, it's lost with my grandmother. It was lost. No one ever got her recipe, right? But I can go just down the street and I walk into these little hole in the walls here and it feels like I'm walking into my grandma's kitchen. That's what it feels like to me. It feels like home to me. So I don't like to plan what I'm gonna say. I speak from the heart. I speak of who I am because I think each of you have that. And it's important what's in your heart is important to you, to your family, to this community, and it's important to us. So value, your, value yourself because you are important. You are talented, and we want to help you get there. That's what SAC is for. We're here for that. So I appreciate the invitation. I appreciate you allowing me some space to be a little bit vulnerable. But when I'm, a, when I'm among mi gente, there it's easy because I know each of us are speaking kind of the same language and from the same kind of point of context at times. So thank you so much. This is going to be a great month. We've got a lot to celebrate. We've got a lot of work to do, but we've got a lot to celebrate and be happy for and be very, very thankful for. So thank you, Dr. Ramos, and thank you all for this amazing invitation. Uh, please know that we're here for you. Whatever you need, we're here for you uh, on your journey, and we're going to help you and see you through. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vela. Good really pleasure. appreciate your words, taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you so much for opening us up with your wonderful story. Um, 
I know I speak for the historians and well, most of us here that that's when we feel a connection, we feel the community. And that's what I think is special about SAC is that we're always wanting to know each other's story. So thank you for sharing yours. I never knew all this about you. So it's wonderful. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to um, Isaac Papa Bear Gardenas. But before I do, I want to read a land acknowledgement that we've been using. So you should see it on my screen. Does everyone see the land acknowledgement? Yes, we do. Awesome. Okay, so for those who aren't familiar with it, it is a way of showing gratitude to indigenous peoples who have been living and working on these lands for thousands of years. So they are still here, they were here, they are the original, the OGs, the pioneers. So this is our thanks to them. So I'm just gonna read it and you can follow along. If you want a copy of this later, just send me um, or post in the chat. So we want to thank the indigenous caretakers of this land. We'd like to begin by acknowledging San Antonio College and San Antonio, Texas occupy indigenous lands. We acknowledge the Bayaya people of Yanawana, as San Antonio was known to them and is known to their descendants. And we acknowledge the Tapilam Coahuilteca Nation who are native to what we now call the South Texas and Northeast Mexico region. We also acknowledge the Carrizo Comecrudo Nation whose traditional territory we are also living on. Finally, we acknowledge other native nations within Texas whom various settler colonizer societies forcibly displace from their native territories. As past, present and future caretakers and knowledge keepers of this land, we are committed not only to acknowledging these indigenous lands and indigenous peoples, but also committed to addressing and deconstructing our own privileges and our own internalized settler colonizer thoughts and behaviors. We respectfully ask for permission to teach, to learn and to grow on these lands. Over the next month, we will strive to counter the doctrine of discovery, which for too long has dismissed indigenous peoples with stories and practices of survival, strength, and peace. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Isaac Papaper Gardenas. Thank you. Shumanam, buen dia, good morning. I want to welcome everyone to Wanaka Wapupaco, Yanawana, commonly known as San Antonio, Texas. I want to welcome, as we say, a good morning to all the men, women, all the two spirits, all the children in our community. A powerful words that were just spoken about the first people, the first nations. When the strangers came, the colonizers and the settlers, they didn't know how clever our people were. They didn't know that we could able to bridge the past to the present. Passing the knowledge forward from generation to generation is a way that we fight and the way that we fought. Colonization, the collective. We have taken the colonizer's knowledge and put it on its ear, encoding our beliefs, our children with our ancestors, energy, to become like you all, the new keepers, the new keepers of knowledge and wisdom. This conquest mentality is still here. It still exists. Denying these that are the most difficult times for our people, maintaining our community, our nations, strong, healing ourselves, healing others, cleansing ourselves with our medicine, with our medicine, that comes from our mother earth. The ancient practice of balance and harmony, of connecting with nature. Thank you ancestors for all you that you sacrificed, all that you built. Thank you for letting us stand on your shoulders. This magical institution, this spiritual institution that is not recognized by the, by the rest of society to connect with our mother earth. We are not blind to the life of indigenous living in balance. We are with nature. We are with harmony. And with that, with song, I will 
call on to our ancestors to be with us. If any of those have lost relatives or elders in this time, this is what we do. We sing and we call on to the spirit world that they be with us today, that they be with you all in this panel to be able to speak good and to speak the words. I come from the richest barrio in San Antonio, commonly known as the West Side. My ancestors go back thousands of years when we accumulated this land near San Fernando number one. And we've always lived here and we're so proud of our place. Many historians like Jose Francisco Ruiz, who was the first person that signed the Declaration of Independence on the, on the Brazos. Our people were there, Los Tejanos, leading and still here with our foods, with our cultures, with our traditions, with our musica. <laughs> Good morning, ancestors, grandmother, grandfather, all the spirits to burn this sage, to cleanse, to rejuvenate. We ask all of those people here in our in our barrio, in our neighborhood, on this reserve, in the shadows of the big city, to heal us in these difficult times. Our elders, our men, our women, our children, our two spirits, we ask for those blessings. We ask that this smoke that we prepare here with our agency of American Indians of Texas at the Spanish colonial missions, be able to go out into the neighborhood and to be able to bless everyone. And every time, maybe you don't have sage that you can burn, but maybe you have a tortilla that you can heat the comal. And like our grandmothers with like magic would get water and throw it and make that shh sound. And then taking that tortilla and putting it on the command and watching the molecules change and the bubbles come up. And then not with a fork, but with your manos, our, our mothers, our grandmothers with their hands, turn that tortilla over to the other side. And for you all to allow it to burn because the perfume of the burnt tortilla will permeate through your home, through your neighborhood, and people will remember. So in meditation and closing, think about all those good words that have been said and the words that you're about to say. And this time of our Samana de Recuerdo, we were able to go to Mission San Antonio de Valero and pray for our ancestors. Our Samana de Recuerdo goes all the way to the day after Thanksgiving. We have our ceremony at one of our missions, San Juan Capistrano. So pray for our people also. We all say Damok. Thank 
thank you so much to Isaac Papa Bear Gagnanas and the American Indians of Texas at the Spanish Colonial Missions. We're very appreciative for opening us up and for reminding us who we are, where we come from. And so I would like now to turn it over to Dr. Joanne Hymas, who is our moderator for our opening ceremony, which we're calling Mi Gente Through the Ages. And we have five fabulous speakers who are gonna talk about their own identities, how they came to consciousness and why they are who they are. But before I do that, I do wanna say a little something about Dr. Hymas. So as I mentioned, um, fellow Brownsvilleite, we're both from Brownsville, Texas, so little bias there, but Dr. Hymas is fabulous. She is our director of the Center for Teaching and Learning here at SAC, and she is a former migrant worker, the daughter of Mexican immigrants, and the first in her family to obtain a college degree. She earned her associate's degree from Marshalltown Community College, a bachelor's degree from Buena Vista University, a master's in public administration from DeVry University, and her doctorate of philosophy and educational leadership from Iowa State University in December, 2019. Congratulations on that. Her research focus is using technology to create a college going culture in Latinx homes. She's also conducted outreach to first generation college students and families and helped create partnerships to bridge diverse communities in Iowa. Among her many awards, Dr. Hymas is a 2013 fellow of the National Community College Hispanic Leadership Program and a 2020 American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education graduate fellow. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Hymas. Help me welcome her. Thank you, Dr. Ramos. Um, hello, everyone. It is great to be here. Um, it is very exciting to be able to, to talk to um, our panelists today and have this plática about mi gente through the ages. Um, and I guess Dr. Vela did a, a great job at explaining mi gente. Um, yes, being at San Antonio College really reminds us who we are and who we are here for. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce our speakers, and I do have um, a short bio for every one of our speakers, but I think it would be better if, if we hear from you. And we do have a few questions that we wrote out, but if anyone that is uh, in attendance would have a specific question about our identity, um, who we are as people, our culture, please feel free to address it and add it in the chat. Um, I, I would like to introduce Jasmine Mendes. If you want to say a little bit about yourself and, and perhaps maybe share a little bit about your earliest memory of when you became aware of your identity. Hi, yes, uh, good morning. It's morning still. Um, good morning, Jasmine Mendez. Uh, I'm here in Houston, Texas, and just slight apologies, I'm dealing with some allergy stuff going on, so <clears throat> hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, yeah, I actually, um, I was born and raised in the United States. Uh, from, I was born in Alabama, but I'm a military brat. My family is originally from the Dominican Republic, um, and I actually um, hail from, if you will, San Antonio. I went to high school in San Antonio um, and actually took a couple of classes at San Antonio College. So it's um, quite an honor and a privilege. Um, thank you to, to invite me back after so many years um, and to share and talk a little bit about my experience. Um, as I said, I live in Houston. I came to University of Houston um, in 2002, and I've been here ever since. Um, I'm a poet and a writer. Uh, I've published two books and have my third uh, coming out now in the fall, a debut picture book, Josefina's Habichuelas. Um, and it's all about um, Dominican culture and food uh, and family and all the good stuff. Um, and for me, I'll say that I came into an awareness. Um, there were, there, I would say there were two pivotal moments, I think, for me 
with regard to my identity. Um, I have always identified as Latina. I've always identified as Dominican, Dominican American. Um, and I think at my first awareness of that probably came fairly early on, um, second or third grade. Um, and I think, um, because for me growing up in the South, like I said, as a military brat, we moved around a lot and it was predominantly in the South. And this was in the early 90s, late 80s, where bilingual ed, ESL, it was not a thing yet. It was not something that was sort of standard or expected. And so to everyone, I was just this little black girl who spoke Spanish um, and people were incredibly confused. But at the time, and for many, many years, uh, to my own dismay, I did not identify as black. I was Latina or Hispanic. I, back then it was Hispanic, then eventually became Latina. Um, I didn't actually come into understanding or knowledge of Afro-Latinidad um, until I was in college. That was that was the first time I heard the phrase or the word and I was like, that that's me, that's what I am, that's what it encompasses. I have my own issues with the label at the moment, but um, racially I identify as black, ethnically I identify as Latina. And like I said, it was probably around third grade, um, moving around a lot every couple of years and you show up at school, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and I, I picked up English right away. So, um, you know, I was just fully immersed in kindergarten. By December, I was fluent in English. So it wasn't um, that, you know, I didn't speak English, but when folks would see me or they'd find out that um, I was Latina or Hispanic, um, you know, they would be confused. And then they would ask me like, well, say something in Spanish or they wanted to learn all the bad words, you know, at lunchtime that I knew, et cetera, right? Um, or they would just be so confused. And for me, um, it was hard for me to understand why they were confused because everyone in my family pretty much looked like me. So I didn't really understand like, like the black Latinos were like a purple unicorn or something um, that, that came a little bit later, right? Um, especially also living in San Antonio. I think in San Antonio in high school was when I really came to an understanding of like how othered and different I was as an Afro Latina compared to the wide, you know, predominantly Mexican Chicanx population in, that is in San Antonio, because most of the Mexican population, most of the Chicanx folks, at least in high school, wanted nothing to do with me. I was not black enough for the black kids. I sounded like a white girl. Um, so as typical, I found the one Puerto Rican that was on campus and me and the Puerto Rican were best friends. Um, and she's a good friend of mine till this day. Um, she was also a military brat. And so, uh, you know, and, and growing up, that's who we tended to, um, hang out with as a family. There was a lot of Puerto Ricans in the military. And so we found the other Puerto Ricans, the occasional Dominican family and all of the military families that were Puerto Rican or Dominican or Cuban, we'd all hung out, play dominoes on the weekends, barbecue, et cetera. So to me, that was, I was always immersed in the culture despite whether we lived in Germany, Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee, or Texas, we were always immersed in um, our Dominican culture or Caribbean culture because of the people that my parents chose to surround themselves with um, being in the military. Um, but then I will say that I didn't really come into my Black identity, um, unfortunately, until my late 20s, um, up during, um, after the death of Sandra Bland, um, which happened 40 miles from my house. And when I saw her and I saw what had happened, I was like, oh, she looks like me. Oh, that could really happen to me. It really kind of came into my purview sort of with Trayvon Martin, um, but then it really hit home and I really started having sort of a lot of anxieties around my blackness and identifying as a black woman with the death of Sandra Bland. Um, and yeah, it took me that long because growing up, I always heard, you're not black, you're not black, you're Hispanic, you're Latino, you're not black, you're Dominican, you're not right. black, you're Dominican. So anyway, um, yeah, so those, those I think were the two sort of big, big things well, for me. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing all that. It is it's great to meet you. Um, Graciela, can you share a little bit about you and perhaps share, um, maybe answer what your earliest memory is of uh, becoming aware of your identity? Uh, buenos dias. Um, uh, thank you for again, inviting me to sit on this panel. Uh, uh, Jasmine, thank you for your stories. It reminded me of <laughs> the fact I am Mexicana. Uh, uh, born and raised in San Antonio's West Side, um, along with Isaac, as he mentioned as well. Um, so, I mean, I think we we were immersed in a, in a community in a neighborhood that was essentially Mexican, Mexican American, um, and I always felt outsider. And I, to this day, people have denied me my identity as a West Sider, as somebody coming from San Antonio's working class neighborhood. Um, I think, you know. Partly 
there's my light skin. I think that there's a question later on maybe about privilege and that's part of it. Um, but, you know, my dad, my dad's side of the family was born, was from South Texas and, and, and his dad grew up in the West side in, in 1900. Um, but he went to Mexico. So when he went to Mexico, they went to the Veracruz Tampico area. So my dad came when he was 13, 14, knowing how to dance salsa, merengue, Caribbean music, um, you know, black beans, white rice, you know, it was that reality. And coming to San Antonio where the, the Norteños, the Northern Mexico, uh, you know, it was the reality and the different type of music was, you know, chotis and redovas and polcas. And so I, I got that from my mom's side. Um, but, you know, dad was a culture, culture bearer is still, right? He's still with us. And, you know, he taught us how to dance from the beginning. And I was moving my hips too much and people made fun of me. And <laughs> I was outsider until I went to college and hung out with the Puerto Ricans and the Cubanas. And, <laughs> and it's like, ah, finally, people who dance like me and who enjoy the music, I also enjoy. Not that I didn't support and love this other, my mom side. And I also learned that music, but in San Antonio, that was outsider too. So thank you, Jasmine, for reminding me of that reality of always kind of being outsider. Um, but um, kind of identities and mi gente and the questions about it is because uh, like uh, the women of color, writers of Audre Lorde, uh, Sri Moraga, Gloria Anzaldúa, and um, many, many others, they talk about multiple identities, right? So I, I'm here also with mi gente that are, yes, Westsiders, yes, San Antonianos, yes, working class and working poor, but also connecting to, uh, as a woman, as a queer woman, a queer woman of color. And again, those kind of identities that also push you out <laughs> of, of, you know, of what is seen as raza, or gente, you know, and, and struggle all along because, you know, you can be part of, you know, the Chicanx, Latinx community, but just don't talk about, you know, being a feminist or don't talk about being queer or don't talk about, you know, because uh, those are less important than race or class. And it's like, no, what I learned from them is that there is no hierarchy of oppressions, right? That all of right. those come together and that we have to struggle together. Um, and, you know, I, you know, and, and I want to also honor, I really respect that Dr. Vela started with his grandmother, um, uh, you know, and I remember asking Lisa, I said, if there was a way to put my image with my mother's, because again, my mom is toda India, um, and she just passed away in June. And, you know, I was glad that, you know, we honored our spirits because, you know, not only does she stand in, you know, in, in the table with me and all her images as well, but um, her identity was being buena gente, right? Not just mi gente, but buena gente, people who talk about, you know, honoring and loving and caring for their own family and the extended family and the global family. And you did that through just love and care and kindness and giving. Um, I know I should probably <laughs> be silent because there are other people that need to speak, uh, but there's much more. And thank you for the question and all. Thank you very much, Graciela. Yes, we will have more questions for you. Now, Laura, um, if you would like to introduce yourself and perhaps Say a little bit about your earliest memory, uh, becoming aware of your identity. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's still good morning. Uh, my name is Laura Raquel. I am a graduate of San Antonio College, graduated in fall of 2020. And now I'm a transfer student at UTSA. And I see some of my professors in the room. So hi, everyone. Um, so a little bit about me, I was born in Comerillo, Puerto Rico, which is a, a small mountainous town. Um, and there, I was there for the first eight years of my life and everyone looked like me, you know, I, I called it, I call it now shades of beige. 
Um, and so when it came to the United States is, is the first time that I saw other types of, of people. Um, I was excited to move to the United States because uh, as y'all know, Puerto Rico is part of the United States and although we are a colony and looked at differently. So when I was little, I just thought that Puerto, uh, the United States was this magical, great place and I couldn't wait to go there. And I also couldn't wait to see snow. Um, it didn't register with me that snow was cold. Uh, and my parents uh, did this thing where they moved from Comerio, Puerto Rico to Lowell, Massachusetts. So um, the levels of weather were, were very different. Uh, and so when I first saw snow falling, I couldn't wait to play with it. And I asked my dad, I said, Papi, vamos pa fuera. Like, <laughs> let's go outside. And he's like, okay. So we go outside and I'm playing with the snow. I'm falling because I don't know how to walk in this stuff. And this car drives by full of, of, of Americanos and they said, spick, go home. Uh, in my very limited English then, I knew what go home meant, but I didn't know what spick meant. And so I asked my father, papi, guess spick. And my father is fluent in English. And I just remember that he was just so mad and he didn't say anything and he didn't answer me. And he always answered me. And so I thought that it was strange. And I started to learn through the years what the word spick meant. And that was the first time in my life that I identified as being different and being othered. Thank you very much for sharing that, Laura. Uh, Lori, would you like to introduce yourself and, and also answer that first question? Uh, what is your earliest memory of, um, of recognizing or becoming aware of your identity? Lori, is, is Lori on? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, I want to just say thanks for having me here. It's such an honor to be with all of you guys. Um, as far as my first memory of coming to uh, a realization of my identity, mine was a little bit different. Um, I was born in San Antonio, but we moved to Kansas when I was very small. So we lived in Fort Riley. I'm an army brat also. Um, we lived there until we were six. We came back to San Antonio until I was six. And probably when I was around four or so, um, I would say that, so I am the eighth of nine children. And everybody before me was seven years older than me and more. They were all in little steps until me. I mean, until my brother and sister, then my mom waited seven years and had me. <clears throat> so they all taught me all of my brothers and sisters were always with me, teaching me and singing to me. Um, they would teach me my name, my address, uh, my phone number, all of those things. Um, they also taught me how to read very early. And so my first sense of identity really was that I was I belonged to my family. I belonged. I was a son and daughter of Antonio and Nora Gomez, and that I belonged to my pack of wild and brothers, uh, my pack of wild brothers and sisters. Um, we, we lived in a place, we lived on base. So there were lots of different people, lots of different families. Uh, I will say, I don't really remember seeing um, too many Mexicanos. It was, um, you know, we had uh, white people, black people, um, mostly. And so when they would look at us, and my mom has often told me through the years, you know, they would say, what are you? <laughs> what are you? And so um, that was my first uh, sense of identity of who I was. And then as I grew, of course, I took on many identities you know, daughter, friend, mother, uh, wife, and it's, it's been a wonderful experience. I do want to say, though, it wasn't until college that 
I, I found a missing piece of my identity. And that was who I am and from whence I came. And it, it's just a common thread. It wasn't just me. And what I found was that so many people, um, third gen, you know, second generation, third, fourth, and so on of Mexican Americans, we grew up thinking, dressing, acting um, like white people because we were raised like that. We weren't taught our native language. We were taught English. Um, I think, I believe that the reason for that is because the, our mothers and fathers before us went through so much for speaking Spanish and endured so much that they, they wanted us to succeed. But in succeeding, did we really succeed when we had to, it's, it's like a trade-off. We traded who we are to succeed in a white man's world. And I, I don't really think that's success. But the wonderful thing is we're here now and we're learning and we that learn and know once we grasp that, we're able to share that with our younger generations so that they know and that they can start learning who they are and from whence they came because it's really important. Thank you very much for sharing. I'm so sorry we got interrupted. Um, yes, that reminded me of the documentary by, um, I'm so sorry, uh, Stolen Education. And um, for our next panelist, Rene Martinez, they will, can you please introduce yourself and, and also just answer a little bit about the question, um, when did you become aware of your identity? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, first of all. Uh, my name is Rene Martinez, and my pronouns are they, them. Uh, I'm a current SAC student studying biology. Uh, I first became aware of my identity around middle school. Uh, prior to that, I had grew up in Balcones Heights. Um, all of my neighbors were brown. Uh, everybody I went to school with was brown. So there was really no concept of who I was as a Latino person until I moved to the north side of San Antonio. Um, and I really met like my first like white people and they did not let me forget that I was not white um, <clears throat> until I was like in high school. I had faced a lot of uh, racism, uh, just small comments, things like spick and other derogatory terms. Um, and growing up that, that was something that I had ever, I had ever faced. Um, wasn't until I started going to college that I really started to understand who I was as a Latino person. Because uh, while I was in middle school and all throughout high school, I struggled with another identity, which was being queer. Um, and so I had spent so much time trying to initially fight my queerness and then accept and love my queerness. that I wasn't able to spend as much time on uh, figuring out who I was as a Latino person. Um, and so that has been a uh, a little bit difficult as I've become an adult now. I don't speak Spanish. Um, both my parents also are not fluent in Spanish as well. Um, I actually didn't find out that my grandfather was an immigrant until I was about 15, 16. But I had no idea that I had this uh, whole other family in Mexico um, that I had never met. Um, I also didn't know that like my great grandparents had been here for quite some time. Um, a lot of this wasn't really taught to me, I guess, growing up. Uh, my parents had kept it under wraps. And I believe, like Loria had mentioned, uh, we face so much, they face so much for uh, speaking Spanish and being Mexican that when it came time for them to have kids, they just felt that it'd be better off for them to not uh, learn fluent Spanish. And uh, I feel like it's been a big hindrance for me today because there is this missing piece of me that I've been trying so hard to find uh, for so long. And it's connecting with my uh, Latin her heritage and my indigenous heritage to uh, San Antonio. Thank you very much. It's great to meet you, Rene. Um, if, again, if anyone in the audience has any questions for any one of our panelists, please feel free to uh, type it in in the chat. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next question. And if any one of the panelists would like to answer it first, uh, what privileges do you feel 
that you have that others may not have? Um, or what privileges do you not have that others do? So to any one of our panelists, please feel free to jump in or, or I can start. Okay, I go ahead, start. Lori. Oh, I think someone else said they'd start. I'll, I'll go after. Go ahead. Okay. Um, sorry, Lori. Um, I think we hit it at the same time. So <laughs> I feel like some of the privileges that I have is that uh, I went to school in Massachusetts, um, and, and this could be a blessing or a curse, right? Um, and one of the things that uh, they didn't like was that I spoke English with this funny accent. Uh, and so I went through speech classes to get rid of sounding Puerto Rican and sounding more just generic uh, white. You know, if you if you didn't see me, if you didn't see my face, you would think that I was an American. Uh, so that can be a privilege in that in in corporate America or, or places like that where you get judged by your accent or you you're not understood uh, because you have an accent um, that could is a privilege uh, where I don't have a privilege is that uh, Yo soy negrita, you know, I am uh, Afro-Latina. And uh, for the longest time, I'm sure you get some of you guys saw me, I would blow dry my hair and dye it like a shade of blonde um, until it was straw. And I recently decided to embrace my curls and totally embrace my Latinidad, my blackness, and I'm unapologetically so. Um, and so that's where I don't have a privilege. Sorry, Lori, go ahead. It's okay, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so for me, as far as what privileges do I have that others may not, um, for me, it's the freedom that I have, that I had um, to pursue my dreams and the way that my parents raised us they never made us do anything we didn't want to do with our lives. They encouraged us. They believed in us. Um, that, that privilege is incredibly beautiful because they strengthened my wings with every encouraging word, with every hug, with every time that they supported me when I had ideas that were unconventional. They, they, um, would look at me and I'm sure sometimes think I was a little crazy, but they would support me. Um, and I think that's really, really wonderful. I watched my mom uh, grow as I was growing. I watched her. I watched how she cared for my, for my dad and for my grandmother and for all nine of us kids. I watched her clean. I watched her cook. I watched her keep everybody's stuff in order. Um, and still she would find time to make like the coolest Easter baskets in the world. I don't know how she did it with so many children, but um, I, I can only say God gave her the strength to do what she needed to do because it's not easy doing all those things. Um, <clears throat> and then on the flip side of that, I would watch my dad as, as a little girl, I would sit and watch him as he would conduct a business and he would just call and, hey, this is Antonio Gomez. And he'd just start talking. And as a, as a young child, as a little girl, I perceived that as my daddy must be like the most important man in the world. Everyone knows him. <laughs> Everyone knows him. And, and the funniest thing out of all of that, guys, is that I am so much like both of my parents in so many ways. Um, I am, I have taken on what my mom used to do and caring for my, my, our kids, my husband, myself, my mom, and she lives with us now. And, um, it's wonderful. And, and the funny part is that my husband will often say to me, Lori, you talk to everybody like they know you. <laughs> I'm like, cause, cause that's what I learned. That's what my daddy did. So I could like be cold calling you and like, you know who I am <laughs> as far as, as far as, 
uh, what privileges I don't have that others might, that was a really difficult question for me because I really believe that you can accomplish anything that you are willing to work for. I've always, and again, that goes back to my parents always teaching us that you can be and can do whatever you want to do. Um, however, when I thought about it a little bit more, I would say probably the biggest privilege I don't have that others have is growing up being completely immersed in your heritage, in your culture, in the traditions of your fathers and your mothers before you. And um, I think growing up like that is, that's amazing because to me, I think it's, it provides solid uh, foundation for who you are and from whence you came. For me, it wasn't until I got to college at 50 years old that I started to discover these things. And it was in my class, in my fine arts, Mexican American fine arts appreciation class, that she gave us an assignment called Conocimiento. And I started to ask questions. And I'm like, holy smokes, I don't know anything on this page. But when I started to find out and I started to dig, I started to discover all these wonderful things. Like my, uh, my dad, he, he served in the army for 27 years. He retired. He went to school. He graduated. He became a teacher. He taught at Tulane University and then here in Alamo Heights. Um, my uncle was a, a photographer for NASA and he took the, he took pho photographs of the Apollo 11, the first space mission, all the way up into all several different sp uh, space shuttles. He also photographed eight United States presidents. His work was featured on almost every magazine cover. Um, he has photographs hanging in the Smithsonian and in museums all over the world. Another uncle founded Centro, uh, Centro del Barrio, which is now known as Centro Med, and provides um, medical care for families that otherwise might not have that. Um, so what I found was I have this great rich history and I never knew it. And the other thing that I realized in all of that was my grandparents on both sides were educated only up until third grade. And my one grandfather never attended school. However, he was, uh, he loved opera. He loved classical music. He had a suits tailor made. He was an explosives handler. Um, my other grandparents were migrant workers. They would take all of their children, 11 kids to go work. I think they called it the Northern wave or something like that. They'd go up and pick all kinds of stuff. Then they came to San Antonio in the great depression and they uh, were entrepreneurs. They opened a business in Molino. So I said all that to say this, we, we have to know our history. We have to be able to have it included in history books because if not, our history dies with our grandparents, with our parents. And so that's, um, that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lori. Sure. Um, Jasmine, would you like to uh, perhaps talk a little bit about what privileges you feel you have that others may not, or what privileges you do not have that others do? Yeah, for sure. As um, with regard to what privileges I do have, um, you know, I have class privilege. Um, I'm considered, you know, middle class. I have housing security privilege. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I know where I'm going to live, even if we don't have power right now um, at, my, at my actual house, but I, I don't have um, housing insecurity. Um, I have education privilege. I have two graduate degrees um, and a bachelor's as well. And so I have education privilege. Um, I believe that being completely bilingual in both English and Spanish is a privilege. Um, I'm able to, to get what I need in one language or another or help others um, get what they need by translating for them. Um, and I have uh, cis hetero privileges. So I'm, I'm not trans, I'm cis and I'm 
married and I have a daughter I'm married to a man. So I have, I don't necessarily have um, that fear of being attacked or being something taken away from me or looked at in a, in a different way um, because of my sexuality or gender. Um, but on the reverse of that, and I'm sure I have many other privileges. I have some able-bodied privileges, but not all, because I do have multiple chronic illnesses and do have some uh, physical limitations. Um, so that is uh, something that that I'm constantly navigating just as, as a human. Um, but I also, um, you know, I'm like Laura, I am a Negrita, I am a black woman. Um, that is not something that I can strip away from or, or um, you know, ignore or pretend doesn't exist. And that definitely does impact the way in which I am perceived both in a professional um, in the professional world and in my personal life, um, even, you know, for, for a long time, I suffered with um, anxiety attacks just from getting in the car and driving, um, living here in Texas. And so it's something that is constantly on my mind um, and that I'm aware of. Um, and one of the reasons that I have the language privilege of being bilingual is because my dad said, you know, I want you to have a leg up in the world because when you go to an interview, um, it doesn't matter what's on your resume, they're going to see the color of your skin before they see anything else. And if you can have um, the ability to say that you're bilingual, then it will hopefully help you get a foot in the door, um, you know, aside from anyone else. And which is also why he, you know, insisted that education was so important and that I go to grad school and do all of these things so that, you know, um, like they say, um, as, as a black woman, I have to do twice as much to be considered half as good. Um, and so that's, that's something that I'm always um, thinking about and striving towards um, to, to break down that idea um, because I, I do work very hard and I'm going to get twice as much <laughs> because I deserve um, that much. So those are some of the things that, that I think about with regard to privilege. Thank you. Um, Graciela, would you like to share a little bit about um, or answer the question about what privileges you feel you have that others may not or what privileges others have that you don't. Sure, thank you. Um, I think I had mentioned earlier on, again, my light skin privilege. And if, again, you saw images of me and my mom, my mom is dark skin my, and three of my siblings are dark and the other three of us are light. And somehow I seem to be the whitest of them all. <laughs> so um, my mom, even growing up, I mean, they assume when she was carrying me or if I was on a stroller that she was my criada, right? So she took care of me. She couldn't be my mother, right? And that, so I heard those stories and I heard constantly, and I saw how, again, my sister or my brothers couldn't get jobs working on the river walk, working at the zoo, even though they had degrees from University of Pennsylvania or Yale, um, because they came back to San Antonio, to Texas, and the racism of this city is profound, right? And so, you know, that was a constant um, and still is and how that affects people, how racism affects our communities, you know. So I, 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 I can also feel the, the role of racism even with my light skin because I, you know, one of the privileges I got was that I had a father who uh, supported the women in his life from his wife to the two daughters. And so even though I had four older brothers, we, he empowered us. And, and there's a lot to be said about men who support the women in their lives, um, because that allows us to grow and to succeed a little bit more. I also grew up again with the privilege of uh, travel, right? My father, again, being raised in Tampico in the Veracruz area, um, it was right by, you know, the, it, the shores, right? The travel, the Navy. So he, he was also in the military in World War II, but his desire was for his children to travel, not by working, but even if it meant just going from San Antonio to Corpus or San Antonio, whatever, and then to meet our, our grandparents in Mexico. So that way he, you know, it was connecting us, it was connecting us to our culture, to our history, to our people. Um, and, and mom was a very good, um, you know, a bookkeeper. So we always survived on one salary of my father who was a, 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 a he painted cars. So, you know, I remember my first job, I was making $16,000 and he was making 12,000, right? After having worked 30 or something years. So we know that he wasn't making a lot of money um, and he was raising six kids plus himself and his wife. So they made ends meet enough for us to travel. We had books. 
we had books, not because we bought the books, but because we were, you know, somebody was giving us hand-me-downs of books, hand-me-downs of clothes, things like that. So I was raised working class and, and, um, but I had these elements that, uh, you know, education was important, travel was important, um, and that I had a mom who, because she stayed at home, she didn't just stay, you know, cuidando la casa, she became a, a, an advocate for children. She said, not for you, not for my kids, but for the kids that don't have another, you know, and what I realized at that point, it was true. All my friends had just one parent, you know, either somebody's dad had died of diabetes, um, you know, mainly it was about sickness, not because, you know, but there was only one parent. And so my family became the family, the, the father and mother figure for all my friends. <laughs> um, but that was something that was stabilizing. And then the grounding of my history, culture and traditions, which has led me to the work of Esperanza, uh, where we do the cultural grounding, the importance of doing that teaching of race, uh, of, you know, where we come from, because the universities, the high schools don't necessarily teach it. And as we see, when the powerful re recognize that we have power in learning, then they come and, and knock it down from us. So um, I'll stop because I know <laughs> you're looking at the time. <laughs> Thank you. But I have all the other stuff of the, the, uh, the non-privilege, so we don't, I'll talk about it later maybe. Thank you. Rene, would you like to answer um, that same question? Are there any privileges that you have that others don't? Or um, what are the privileges that others have that you may not? Yeah, <clears throat> um, so I feel like I definitely do have uh, most of the privileges that come with, or all the privilege that come with being a citizen of the US and most of the privileges that come uh, with being a male presenting on the outside. Um, however, when it comes to privileges I don't have, um, I don't have the privilege of feeling safe in every single space that I go. Uh, being a queer person, it's uh, incredibly uh, difficult to find spaces where I do feel safe, accepted, and validated, and they're far and few in between. Um, so I don't always have that privilege of being able to just, you know, go into a restaurant and not get stares or the snide remarks from other people, um, even in the workplace as well. Um, that's always been something that has lacked for me um, as well. I don't have the privilege of having 100% stable uh, housing. I currently live in affordable housing um, and this is my entire apartment, it's pretty small. Um, prior to this, uh, I was homeless throughout the pandemic. Um, I had to live with my parents and that was a very difficult living situation because they are very openly uh, homophobic and unapproving of how I live my life. Um, even if it's covert, they're still very, very uh, disapproving of it. Um, and before that, I was homeless also as well, uh, before the pandemic, and I only managed to keep an apartment for about a year before everything happened. Um, so I don't have that privilege. Um, I don't have the privilege of having a stable job as well. Being queer uh, makes it pretty difficult for me to be able to secure a full-time job outside of the service industry. Um, I have attempted to work in professional settings. Uh, I worked for Wells Fargo corporate for two years. Um, and I managed to make it all the way to a supervisor position uh, before being uh, before being fired for um, uh, for not coming into work uh, because of like mental health issues. So I don't have that like 100% able-bodied uh, privilege either. Um, I suffer from bipolar depression. I have pretty, gnarly anxiety. Um, I've also lived with HIV for five years. So there is uh, quite a bit that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis as far as my health is concerned. That doesn't give me the same privilege uh, that other people who don't have chronic illnesses uh, have. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, so our next question is, um, each of you uh, talked about a little a little about your identity, your privileges. Um, and I think Laura covered, what am I? So the next question is, when did you decide what problem or topic or issue you were going to resolve 
with your career or position. So when did you know what you were going to be when you grew up? Um, maybe we can start with you, Rene. Sure. Um, I love talking about this question. Um, so when I was coming of age as an adult, uh, 2021, um, and I was coming into my sexuality and really owning it, um, I had noticed that there was a lack of comprehensive sexual health education. Uh, as a queer person, I did not know how to engage safely in having sex with other uh, with other men. I didn't wasn't really aware that there were drugs like uh, PrEP um, or even PEP, uh, which is post exposure prophylaxis, which you can take 72 hours after exposure to uh, HIV. And there's almost 100% chance that like it won't, uh, you won't have an infection. Um, so knowing that I had I knew that I had wanted to do something in the field of making sure that young queer people in grades K all the way up through senior year of high school um, have access to health education and sexual health education that is appropriate for their age level, but also is comprehensive and talks about things like uh, gender identity and sexuality um, and like how to properly use a condom and that doesn't preach abstinence. So it really settled in for me that I wanted to do this uh, when I, on the May 15th, uh, I believe 2017, uh, when I uh, got my, I got that phone call that I was uh, HIV positive. And I remember being so mad at myself uh, for allowing this to happen, but I also took a step back and said, you know, like, this isn't 100% my fault. There are other things here at play that led me down this path. Um, and apologies if I get a little shook up, it's a little difficult talking about this. But um, after that, I was like, no, this is probably the career that I want to, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life is make sure that this doesn't happen to other people because uh, it has been a challenge uh, living with this disease. I've uh, nearly lost my life twice, um, initially during infection, uh, during the steroid conversion period. And then a couple of years later when I got an opportunistic infection and was in the hospital for five days, um, and I just, I remember in all those moments were moments where I was like, you know, this is something that I need to continue doing. I need to fight to eradicate this because obviously our government uh, isn't doing anything to help these, this group of people who is so greatly affected by this one virus. And it's essentially just forgot about them. Um, and there needs to be people that are out there that are like, you know, we haven't forgot about you. And we need to make sure that not only are you cared for and that you have access to life-saving medication and uh, healthcare, but that future generations aren't afflicted by this and don't have to live their life. Queer people don't have to live their lives in fear of contracting something that could potentially kill them. And that's why I chose to be a biology major. And uh, I have a couple more classes before I graduate from SAC with my associates. And then I'll be transferring to uh, UTSA to complete a degree in public health. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, to our other panelists, uh, the same question goes um, to all of you, whoever wants to jump in and answer. When did you decide what you wanted to be when you grew up? What problem you wanted to solve? I'll jump in. Um, for me, it's, it's changed a little bit, but overall, it's always been in the same thread of um, creating art um, to, to help tell stories, um, whether that was through theater, which is what I started in. Um, I always believed I was going to be on Broadway and I was gonna win a Tony. And um, I would say I made it as far East as Houston. Um, but uh, then life threw a couple curveballs at me um, including multiple chronic illnesses, autoimmune diseases um, which made acting and theater performance very difficult. Um, and so I immersed myself in my writing which is poetry. And I decided that um, you know the theater world as well as the publishing and liter literary world um, don't have never really featured folks who look like me and sound like me, um, you know, Black, Latinx people um, from the Dominican Republic or elsewhere. Um, you just don't really see or hear our stories in the media um, or elsewhere. And I wanted to change that. You know, I believe, um, you know, on my website, there's a Toni Morrison quote that says, if there's a book you want to read that hasn't been written, then you must write it. And that is my philosophy. I want to be able to write the books and tell the stories um, that 10 year old me needed, that five year old me wanted, that 13 year old me was begging for, that 19 year old me didn't have, that 25 year old, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so I write and tell these stories for, um, you know, all the 
the, the young children and people and little Dominican American, um, you know, kids and, and just individuals out there that are yearning to see themselves represented um, in these stories and yearning to feel connected. And, um, you know, you can't, you can't dream it, right? You can't know that you can do a thing um, if you don't see yourself represented in that thing, right? And like growing up, I didn't think I could be a writer because I only saw white writers. I was only introduced to white writers. It, was, it wasn't until I was a junior in high school that I read when I was Puerto Rican by Esmeralda Santiago, which was like the closest thing to my experience, you know, growing up. Um, and then I looked for more writers. I found more New Yorican poets and writers and um, eventually encountered a couple of uh, Dominican writers, uh, Angie Cruz and Julia Alvarez. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to change that. I wanted to be able to, to be a part of sort of this literary renaissance um, and, and tell stories that feature um, Afro-Dominican, um, you know, boys and girls, women, men, et cetera, and tell those stories um, because it's important to me. Um, because art changed and saved my life. And so I just hope that the things that I can create, you know, someone will hold on to and say, this, this helped me stay alive today. This helped give me hope today. Um, and so that's why I do what I do. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, to our other panelists um, that, that haven't answered this question, when, when did you decide what career you wanted to pursue, what problem you wanted to fix in the world? I'll go. Um... I'm sorry, I'm a little emotional over Rene's story, which thank you for sharing so much. So when I decided, um, I'm still deciding what I want to do when I grow up. I feel like that should be an ever ending quest, by the way. Uh, but what I, when I first decided that what I wanted to do was study um, Mexican American studies, ethnic studies, was when I took Dr. Gaisa's class, and she's actually in the audience today. Um, and it was the first time that I saw myself represented in, in a classroom, that I heard the stories of the people of Latin America, um, and that these stories are there, but they're, they're hidden, they're not told, um, but they're there. Um, so I, I felt like it was hidden, but not hidden. Um, and I also wondered about the stories of, of, of my own people. And like Jasmine, um, I didn't see myself represented I, I, as, a, as a Puerto Rican girl, even though that we are uh, part of the United States. And so I felt like Dr. Geisa's class changed my life. Um, and I want to go on this ever ending quest for knowledge about the peoples of Latin America, and also to teach that knowledge. Thank you very, very much. Um, Lori and Graciela, would, would you like to answer that question? Um, can you hear me? Because I am having problems with my internet, it seems like. Yes, Is, I can, can you hear. hear me now. Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, out of, you know, growing up, you know, I was very outspoken. I challenged my. Oh, no. Did... I can't hear her. I think we may have lost her, but she'll probably call back. She has a hotspot she's using. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, I can answer while we're waiting, if that's okay. Yes, please, Lori. Okay. So as far as when did I find out what I wanted to do when I grow up? Well, I don't, I don't have any intentions of growing up ever, but I think I do know what I want to do. <laughs> um, so I'll start by sharing a little story that I shared with my son uh, when he was in high school. So it goes a little something like this. So when I was in fourth grade, we had a guest speaker come in. And this guest speaker came in and asked the exact same question. What do you want to be when you grow up? So immediately, like hands started going up. <clears throat> and so he calls on one student and he's like a, a fireman. He calls on another student, a nurse, and still another, a teacher. So um, all of these students had in their mind what they wanted to do. 
Um, me, however, I listened to them all. And this little girl was wondering why I didn't have some grand plan in fourth grade. Um, me, my, my um, thought that day was I didn't raise my hand that day because I felt like my plan wasn't as grand as everyone else's plan. For me, in my little fourth grade heart, all I wanted to be was a wife and a mother. I wanted to be a mom. And so uh, with that being said, I grew up loving to read. I would read to anyone that would listen to me. <laughs> um, in, in my teen years, I decided I wanted to write, that I wanted to write books. And um, <clears throat> my teen years were very difficult years. And um, so needless to say, I didn't write a whole lot. But now that my children have grown and I'm pursuing my education, what I found, uh, especially like in my Mexican-American class is exactly what Jasmine talked about. Um, and, um, and that is that we, we don't see a lot of us in the books, especially in history books. When I started to reflect on what I, what I learned in my education from K to 12, I didn't learn a whole lot about Mexican American history. I learned everything that's in the history books. And so what I realized in, in college was that our Mexican American history has to be taught. It has to be recorded. It has to be included not only ours, but other minorities, because guess what? We were all there and we're all still here and it makes a difference. And our history needs to be taught and known. So I went, I originally went to SAC because I just wanted to take a couple of writing classes. That's it, just to get ready for writing my books. And then I found out, hey, if I take a few more classes, I'll get a liberal arts degree. So I thought, okay, this will work. But after I took that first Mexican American studies class, everything changed. So now I find myself uh, pursuing a degree in Mexican American studies, which was not the plan. <laughs> it Thank wasn't the plan, much. but uh, God had other plans. Thank you, Lori. Okay, Graciela. Yes, that's fine. You don't have to turn your camera on. So if you can, oh. can answer that, that question, um, please. Okay, well, one of the things that uh, I learned very early on was my father telling all his children, be courageous, tell the truth. Don't be like everyone else. Don't be a, you know, a sheep and follow like everybody else. Challenge authority, question. Oh no. Oh, we lost sound again. Yeah, let, let's give her, let's give her about a minute because she came back in pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so hopefully she'll, yeah, You're back. yeah, I guess maybe I'll have to step, step away uh, from this. Uh, again, this is a, a, a privilege I don't have. Uh, I love my West Side, but it, it comes with lack of infrastructure. Uh, again, because it's working class and working poor people of color that live here. I was just going to say that because of the courage I had, I was able to, you know, I thought about being an attorney, but then I worked for attorneys. I worked for civil rights organizations that were Latino male, Mexican, Mexican American led organizations. And that was it. They were sexist. You know, they didn't pay the women like they paid the men. They didn't have health care for the women. If the women got pregnant and had children, they didn't have anything. It was the men. Once the men's wives got pregnant, then they had health insurance. We lost you again, Graciela. Yeah, I guess I'll just listen into the rest of it. it it's I'm having problems. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I'm so sorry. You you could um, t 
type in type your answer in the chat and we can say it out loud for you. Um, and so with with the platica that we've been having with our panelists again, thank you all for agreeing to share your stories um, for talking to us about mi gente, our gente, our identities um, and <clears throat> who we are as as people. We have a couple more questions left and I would like to, um, in addition to uh, seeing Graciela type in her her answer to the question of when she decided what she was going to do in the chat, I am also going to ask a couple more questions to the panelists, but also to all attendees. In listening to the platica, what is one thing that SAC can do um, to make us feel more welcome? Us students, us community, us uh, faculty, and staff at SAC. What is one thing that SAC can do to make our gente feel more welcome and included? And um, the last question is, what is one thing that faculty specifically for um, SAC classrooms can do for us as students? Um, and, and I can open it up if, if one of the panelists would like to answer, maybe unmute yourself, but also I'm going to type these questions into the chat and all attendees can, can answer for us. I'll answer the, the first question uh, about uh, how can I believe how can SAC be more intentional about promoting equity? Was that correct? Yes, correct. Uh, I would say uh, to constantly be reaching out to uh, the most vulnerable students uh, on campus. Um, I feel like that it's super important to ensure that they have access to all the things that they need to be successful um, and that they feel welcomed. In the, and they feel safe enough to be able to come to faculty or uh, their professors and say, you know, I may be struggling financially, emotionally, whatever, and that faculty are able to have also the space to uh, receive that as well. Um, and just ensuring that there is that safe space for those vulnerable students to have their concerns heard. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Any any uh, um, any other uh, panelists that would like to answer that out loud? And we uh, we are receiving chats. Uh, Professor Coleman affirm the use of other languages in our forward facing marketing materials. Yes, um, that's definitely um, something that that is very important for us to feel included. Um, uh, in, in doing outreach to young families with young students. Uh, the students seeing themselves in a college uh, makes them feel that they belong. And listening to their language uh, in a place makes them feel that they belong. Um, seeing their language in writing, in marketing, in promotional material, uh, helps us feel welcome. Um, um, I'll, I'll say, um, I haven't been to SAC in probably over, I don't know, 15 years. So I can't speak to the first question, but I think for me just in general, when thinking about um, curriculum or professors or teachers and K through college, um, and you think about your syllabus and the ways in which you're structuring your courses. Um, again, it, I come from it as from, from the perspective as a writer and a former English teacher. Um, uh, really take a look at the books uh, and the writers and the authors that you're including in your courses, um, because reading, you know, Latinx authors, Mexican American authors, Dominican American authors should not be pigeonholed to the ethnic studies class, should not be only a part of the Mexican American studies class, should not be only a part of the Black literature class. It should be across the board, all teachers, all English teachers, all math, science, whoever, like highlight 
those BIPOC creators, those BIPOC scientists, mathematicians, writers, poets, um, teach living writers, um, you know, teach BIPOC writers, teach LGBTQ plus writers, like authors, mathematicians, scientists, like don't just like the canon, we can make a new canon, like stop with this nonsense, right? Like I, I don't teach any white writers. When I teach workshops and when I teach online classes, um, when I teach any kind of writing workshop, I do, I, why? Because you've already gotten that. Like, I know you're going to get that from elsewhere. So why do I have to do it? I refuse. Um, so I, I teach all BIPOC writers, um, unless they're queer. There are a few queer white writers <laughs> that, I, that I'm willing to teach, um, but I just feel like it shouldn't just be relegated to a month or to a specific ethnic studies course or to a specific event or to one lecture, um, you know, like we don't need to be tokenized. Like, and, and again, those programs are great. Like, don't get me wrong. Like Mexican-American studies departments are great. Ethnic studies departments are wonderful, um, but we should be able to live and exist and be seen everywhere in every course, um, in, in every syllabi. Um, and I think that that's, that's important. Um, and it does take a certain amount of work um, anti-racist anti -racist pedagogy and teaching takes work and it's gonna make people uncomfortable. And so you need to feel and sit with that discomfort. Um, all of us do. And so I think that that's, that's something important to, to consider as professors um, move forward, um, hopefully try to make more space for us. Thank you very much, Jasmine. Um, anybody else uh, from the panel want to answer? I, I do want to go back um, to the chat and Graciela was able to um, type in creating a cultural arts social justice organization. Um, we decided as mujeres, we were going to build a city slash society that allowed us to be our whole selves, to be queer, women of color, feminists, Lat Latinx, working class. We had to be honest and truth tellers and deal with consequences. We were evicted from our initial home. The city defunded us for our progressive voices, but also because we were queer and none of our allies were, were courageous to support us and we continue to be demonized so that many in our community either don't know about us or they're afraid to be associated with us. However, the city has changed in positive um, ways because of our existence. Thank you, Graciela. And if you could um, uh, maybe uh, type in information about uh, La Esperanza um, in the chat, that, that would help us uh, to, to learn more about the services that you do and, um, and, and all of the great work that you're doing for the community. And then she did respond to the last question. I think continue to ask students to tell their stories. Tell the stories of our families, of our communities. Tell the complex stories of the genre that we are. Keep having these conversations, but also get students to know their community. Esperanza is right across SAC, but so many students graduate and then learn about us and ask, why didn't our professors tell us you were right across the way? So yes, thank you, Graciela. There are many, many resources available to SAC students. Um, some of them, a lot of them are on our website and I did include a link in the chat um, to the Student Advocacy Center that includes uh, many services uh, to students. Um, Lori, do you want to, um, do you have an answer to one of the two last questions that I asked? Yes, yes, I do. So I think if I was going to answer one, it would probably probably be what is the one thing that faculty can include in their course that would make students feel welcome. So my answer is the one thing that any teacher, uh, professor, professora would do to make the um, students feel welcome. The most important thing I think is to teach with passion and to teach with conviction. The reason I say that is because on the receiving end of a teacher to sit in someone's class and to listen, the difference is it goes from getting this class over with so you can get your credit to graduate to a completely wonderful learning experience that actually changes you, changes your thinking, changes what you're going to do. 
And so I say that also because when a, when a professor or professora is very enthusiastic about what they're teaching, that's contagious for us students. It makes us want to know more. It makes us want to grow. And if, if I would say anything, it would, it would be that. People definitely need that. And we're, we're all in this together. I talked to a, um, a young gal at the pool over here in our community. She's a lifeguard and she's actually attending um, Incarnate Word. So I was telling her about SAC and about the Mexican-American studies. And I was telling her all the things I was learning. And she, she said, you know, we need teachers like you because some teachers are just like, she said she had a, a, a professora that, oh, a teacher, I'm sorry, that told her, I don't really think I should be a professor. Like, and that she was very, just kind of going through the motions. And that's, that's no good for anyone. So I've been very blessed to have teachers that do teach with passion. And, and conviction. And I think that makes all the difference. Thank you very much. And yes, we do have at San Antonio College and, and other uh, great uh, faculty, teachers, professors that really um, are not in, in the business of just graduating students. It is a transformation and they teach students how to learn and how to be interested in, in what they're learning. And, and some of them are um, attending this panel today. So thank you all the professors at heart um, that, that teach from the heart and, and really um, you know, teach students uh, how to learn and not necessarily about completing a test, completing an assignment, uh, or passing a class. It is, it is more about learning. Um, do we have anyone else that, that would like to answer any of those two questions, either out loud or uh, type it into the chat? <clears throat> I I would like to add um, something. Um, so one of the things, um, you know, I, I was older when I, when I attended college and the syllabus always has call it like office hours. Um, and that's great. But when students come from humble places or they've never met somebody with three letters after their name, they're intimidated. They don't know what to say. They there's also an association with going to the principal's office and being in trouble. Um, and so I think one of the things, and I'm going to bring up Dr. Garza again, um, that she would do is that right after class, she had office hours and we could stick together as a class and talk over the concepts that we just learned or just share something else. And so if you make office hours with a purpose, and this is where I'm going to incorporate some of the things in corporate America, where, you know, you can meet with the CEO and they, he'll schedule an appointment with you and a group of people and maybe schedule office hours with a group of students to talk about some of the concepts in class so they know that you're just a regular person who has their best interests at heart and you're approachable and can help them. Thank you, that, that really helps. So some of the takeaways that, that I hear recommendations for um, specifically for SAC, but also for faculty is to be more inclusive, include um, these opportunities, these safe spaces for students and faculty and staff to share who we are as gente. Um, for us to include more literature on um, Latinx authors, uh, artists, um, professionals, representation matters, um, and uh, specifically, uh, like Lori said, to teach from the heart. Um, yes, great ideas, great ideas by everyone. We do have in the chat 
and attendance sign-up sheet. If you could please uh, fill out that information. Um, and it is about 1247 now. Uh, Dr. Ramos, uh, is there anything that any of the questions that I asked the panelists that you would like to answer um, for yourself about when you decided what you wanted to do when you grew up um, or uh, what we can do at SAC to uh, make our gente feel more included and more welcome? Wow, I didn't know you were gonna put me on the spot. <laughs> Um, you know what, I would love because um, I know we're running out of time and I want to give Joseph like a minute or two to talk about the survey and then announce the three upcoming events in September, but I'm going to do the cop out and throw it back to the audience. Is there anybody here who was inspired or who felt like what one of our panelists said resonated, who wants to just make a comment, share their gratitude or or answer one of the questions. I, I want to open it up to you all to hear what you all thought. You can type in the chat or you can speak up. I really want to thank all of the, the people that are in attendance, all of the attendees for joining us. Um, this is going to be um, we're going to share some of the events that are going to be happening um, to celebrate this one month. Um, but with this panel, let's remember that um, it is not just this month where, where we um, get to share everything that we have to contribute, not only to San Antonio, but to the world. Um, let's let's use our privileges to to reach out to others um, to help everyone feel welcome. Yeah, for sure. So now I'm going to do what I do in class. So when I throw it out to the audience and no one answers, I'm just going to ask a few people that I know. So here it comes. So I see some of my students besides Lori. Um, um, Nati or Marina or Susie. Susie, I saw you posting in the chat a lot and Marina, I saw you also responding to what Rene was saying and others. Is, is there anything you all want to say that you heard today? Remember to unmute, you just have to tap the space bar. I see Susie tied me. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, and read what she said. So Susie Barrera says, I did wanna say thank you for having such an inclusive and informative group. I'm so glad to have such exposure to all of you who are being empathic and willing to share your stories. Love to all. Yes, that, that's what I wanted to say. Um, it's never easy to open yourself up and be vulnerable. Um, and you all did that uh, special Thanks um, to Rene because um, being houseless, I know that is, is difficult, but um, also sharing about our own personal histories and medical histories, I, I know that is, is often tough. So I did want to acknowledge you, Rene, for, for having done that. Um, and then Marina is posting. My grandfather was recently murdered. I never got to show him what he left here on earth. He was a migrant worker and great provider. And I'm so thankful to be here and acknowledge my roots and hear other testimonies and testimonies. It was all thanks to my grandparents. Thank you, Marina. Ooh, that's a hard one to follow. Um, we've been through a lot of loss. I guess this is what I will say. You asked me, Dr. Hymas, um, these questions. You asked your audience, when did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? Um, so many of the panelists said it. I hope I never grow up. I'm always learning 
And um, really, I say this all the time, forgive me if I sound like a broken record, but my favorite moment in every class is when the students feel comfortable that they share their stories. When they say, this is the struggles I've had in my family, or this is how I got here. It took some you know, ups and downs, but when they feel like they belong, every moment that happens, I know this is what I was meant to do. This is why I love what I do because not everybody is gonna trust or feel comfortable. So if I can create that space for students, I've done my job. It's not about the fact, it's not about how many facts, it's about students feeling this is their space, this is where they should be. So. Um, Thank you, Dr. Ramos. On that note, I do wanna give um, a immense amount of gratitude again to all our panelists if we could give them a round of applause and you know, you can do the snaps, you can do the, the virtual, the emojis. Thank you all so much for being vulnerable and sharing this space with us. And I do wanna turn it over to Joseph. Joseph, are you ready? I know you've been waiting for this moment <laughs> to just remind everyone about the survey who is a student. Do you wanna say some words real quick, Joseph? You just have to unmute yourself. Is he here? Did we lose him? I'm looking. Oh, there you are, Joseph. So I'm asking you to unmute if you just want to say something about the survey and now he disappeared. Where'd you go? Well, oh, there you are, Joseph. Okay. You're unmuted, Joseph. So if you just want to tell us a little bit about what the attendance survey is. Not sure if he can. All right, well, so as not to delay, um, thank you, Greg. So um, our Somos La Gente student president um, just posted Gregory Garrett Estrada, the link to the attendance signup sheet. So for students, we do like to keep, we do like to keep a record of who's attended our events. You get credit on your transcript, Alamo experience. So please, if you're a student in Alamo colleges, fill out the survey. And then also I did want to just share my screen in these last few minutes and show you what's coming up in September. So we just had our wonderful opening ceremony, but we do have some amazing events coming up. So I'm just gonna make this a little bigger. And tomorrow, if you are on campus, we have Loteria Fun. Um, Carrie Hernandez at the Office of Student Life has organized this with our Campus Activities Board or CAB. Um, Latinx style bingo prizes will be given away. So if you are on campus, need a break after classes, one to three, please stop by. We also have um, Professor Gerard, Jerry Robledo. Are you here? Still here, Jerry? Um, he's going yes, to be oh, here. Oh, <laughs> no, it's a good say, say a little bit about your event next Thursday uh, evening. <laughs> uh, Thursday evening is going to be a poetry reading uh, by myself, but uh, not by myself. Uh, I will be reading along with two of the great local uh, writers, Vincent Cooper and uh, Joe Reyes Wojtel, uh, who has a new book coming out, I believe. Um, Vincent has a book that came out last, last year, the year before. He's got another one hopefully coming out soon. So I think that'd be a great cross-section of poets in the city uh, and what a lot of our work looks like it, since we're talking about this uh, representation of identity and our voices being similar yet very different. And we are all from the same communities and how we came up. So uh, I'm uh, also Mexican-American. You know, my father was from Mexico. My mother was born in, the, um, in Laredo. So anyhow, you'll hear a whole lot of this stuff by coming out. It'll be one of our few uh, on-campus events uh, next Thursday evening. And then it's also an open mic. So we're encouraging everybody else to come out 
and read your poetry. Uh, we used to have, I was, I, was, I was a student here at SAC and I used to come to these events. I was the MC at the open mic night and we would have comedians. Uh, people would do like dance routines, all kinds of fun stuff. So if you wanna come out and practice your chops, uh, you're welcome to, and you're welcome to hang out and um, show us show us up, because I know there's a lot of y'all that are really great at what you do already. So I hope to see you all there at the events. Uh, I kind of, I think that's enough for me to speak now. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, Professor Robledo. So lastly, at the end of the month, we have Saul Flores, um, a young man in his early 30s. He's doing a presentation called The Walk of the Immigrants. And he did this amazing three month journey of about 5,000 miles from Ecuador to North Carolina. He wanted to experience what it's like to immigrate across, you know, miles and miles, like so many people from not just Mexico, Honduras, um, Ecuador, um, El Salvador, Guatemala. And he did this journey in 2010. And so it's been a while, but he's, and he did it when he was 20 years old, still in college. And he goes around the country and he delivers talks on what that experience was like, the resilience of immigrants, the hardships, but also their hopes. And the reason we're hosting it is one of our students, um, Bailey Davis had actually attended and was so moved that she said, we need to bring Saul Flores to SAC. So because of her, we're hosting him, and I hope you all can attend that. That's gonna be during the day, September 28th, Tuesday. And right after, Joseph Lidicki and folks in the Office of Student Life and some of us from the committee, the Mi Gente Committee, are going to be putting together lunch bags for immigrant families, going to take, it, take the lunch bags over to the bus station to make sure we honor the immigrants who are here amongst us. So we're calling that solidarity with immigrants. And that's right after the Zoom event with Saul Flores. So I hope that you all will be able to make it to some of these events. Um, but it is one o'clock now and I don't wanna keep anyone, but again, thank you so much to our wonderful panelists. Thank you for sharing your stories. May everyone have a blessed day, a blessed week. And we hope to see you at our upcoming events. Thank you so much for being here with us. Bye, everybody. Bye, thank you. Thanks, Greg. You did great. Thank you for helping out in the chat box, Greg, and posting all the links to the Esperanza, the Advocacy Center, um, SAC Moss. I hope you got to post about Somos Moss. Uh, can you hear my mic? I hear you, Greg. Okay, right. sorry. Um, someone had just called me while you were speaking. Oh, no worries. Yeah. So I just wanted to let um, Blake Quadis know because the event just ended. So I didn't know if you wanted to ask a question or um, the event just ended right now at one. So just letting you know since you just got here. I think. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I didn't know if they were here and came back. Um, I, was going, um, I was going to say uh, tomorrow I will be on, or I'm on campus right now, but um, I'm about to leave in just a few minutes, but tomorrow 
Um, I can help with putting up the posters. Um, oh, I'll be here all day tomorrow. Um, uh, and I also have these, but I also have the smaller flags. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. Um, I can, um, I can stop by uh, in a couple of minutes to pick up the the flyers, um, and then tomorrow morning I can start going around and putting them up if you want, or I could come by tomorrow and pick them up. Yeah, I mean either one. I'm going to be here working. I, I'd like to put up a few, but um, either one. Um, I've got thirty of them, and um, today or tomorrow, whichever is easiest on you. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and pick them up um, uh, today. Uh, uh, I'm currently in the, the Sackman Lounge. I did print oh. a couple of our flyers already and put them up in here. Oh, nice. um, so that's covered. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Greg. Appreciate it. But, okay, um, I'll go ahead and head down over there. Um, but yeah, at this, this event was so amazing. And I saw some of my friends from Arizona were in the, um, in the Zoom call. Say that again. Um, a few of my friends um, from Arizona in the UMA Two Spirits group, they were here and I saw them. <laughs> awesome. I'm so glad they came. I think we had a really good group. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. I'll go ahead and let you go. Okay. And then um, Joshua, I don't know if you had a question. If you're there. Okay, I'm going to end the event. So unless you have a question, Joshua, I'll just give you a few more seconds. If you need to unmute yourself, you can just hit the space bar. If not, I'm going to end it. All right, I'm going to stop.